Okay, we've got four agenda items tonight, and we'll start off with the dog warden. Can you guys hear us okay? Have the speakers working? Hello, Matt. Hello, hello, hello. hello. How is everyone? Good, good. Good, good. Um, I'm here just to give you an update, and I know we discussed this, but as of 6 o'clock today, um, hopefully the system's working. Um, our, our phone systems, obviously, the Cisco systems. Um, I never knew this, but we have the ability to do robocalls. Um, I know people hate robocalls, um, but the idea was this year, there's probably at least... 1,500 people that don't license their dog every year. And the biggest complaint we get is How many? I, about 1,500. The biggest complaint we get is I forgot that the licenses are due. The deadline is actually January 31st, which is Saturday. If you don't get them before Saturday, it goes from $15 to $30. And um, so the idea was this year, since we, I talked to Steve Decatur and uh, Frank Leah, they said that our system's capable of doing robocall and calling all these residents. So as of 6 o'clock today, people are going to get a call from me, my office, stating if you own a dog, your deadline is January 31st. Um, if you get it before January 31st, it's $15. If you get it after January 31st, it's $30. Um, I don't see any problem with it or any issues that we're going to have with it, but as we've always done, even when we call people, there's always complaints that, why are you robocalling? The robocalling is no money to us other than just those the, the minuscule amount of um, calls. The system's already in place, and I think that it will generate at least half of those people getting licenses this year, which then obviously reduces the amount of time that we have throughout the year hunting these people down and getting them licensed and regulated. So I think it's a great system. Hopefully it's going to work, knock on wood. So, you know, when you get home tonight, you might hear something on your answering machine. Uh, if you don't have a dog, just delete it and move on with life. But um, we know that there's going to be some people that might have some issues. Where did you get your calling list from? The calling list, and that's funny, is uh, Steve Decatur got it, and he actually, I don't know exactly where he got it from. Um, this was a short or quick notice. As I explained to him, I, I, we, we don't have the ability to get the police, the sheriff, because of the great issue with their 911 system as far as the Amber Alert. But I believe he was able to get another list through the county with landline phone numbers. Because you are the residents. So your cell phone numbers are included in that? Um, to my knowledge, no cell phone numbers are included to it. I would like to see it possibly next year if this works, as far as at least cell phones with people who have already purchased dog licenses in the past and have given us cell phone information. Um, it's, it's not a, none of this is coming from that or being distributed out to different companies or anything like that, so. You should only get one robocall, and that's about it. Are, are you going to be able to, this is, this is the first year, are you going to be able to some way track the the, bit over the next, you know, what the cost is going to be for these calls? There's going to be an invoice at some point in time. Uh, it'll be hard to determine how many people were just going to come in and buy their license tomorrow or, or Saturday or whatever, or whether they were uh, reminded by the call. And the, and, and the biggest way we're looking at going to be able to track it is um, we have the last 10 years of data of how many dog licenses we've ended out the season with, which is January 31st. Okay. Uh, last year we sold 10,000 dog tags. Um, so what we're going to try to base it on is how many that we've increased above that amount. Um, and also, on top of that, how many non-renewals that we have coming in. We, as I say, we have 1,500 every year non-renewals as of February 1st that I have to go through that list. Um, so we're tra going to track it based on those two statistics. If we have less non-renewals as the average in the t past 10 years, 
and the increase of dog licenses, we're going to somewhat, you know, since we've done nothing different, we're assuming that that is that could be the reason that, that we got it. Plus, we're going to track it by phone calls. How many people call in tomorrow and say, hey, I got a phone call, never had a dog license before, what am I supposed to do? Um, so those are statistically the ways that we think we'll be able to track it. But at this point, we won't know. And you get a late start because of the equipment and so on. Yeah. If it, this is somewhat successful, would you consider doing it? two weeks before the deadline and then a little bit before the deadline? Absolutely, 100%. I mean, it was an idea that just was was popped into my head after I called Steve and he says, hey, let's get it. See, I don't even know how many residents will hit this year, but yeah, I think this is, I think it's mandatory. And we're going to actually use it for non-renewals. The 1,500 names that we get that don't license every year, um, we will do a robocall in February and we won't a, I, the call will be very generic is you, you purchased a dog license last year, you did it this year, please call the number so we can update the files. This way no one's offended or anything. They call us, they say their dog passed away, we'll just mark them out of the computer. If they say, oh, we have our dog still, we'll explain to them that they're past the deadline. So knowing that we have this device and this system, um, I just think that it's, it's a great tool to have for what we're doing with the dog licenses. It might be very successful. Might not. It, 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 it's <laughs> so going to be hit or miss, and I would imagine you three, you four, myself, we'll get a few <laughs> phone calls tomorrow. You know, robocalls are always, I have issues with it. I haven't gotten my license yet um, for my dog, so I will, I'm, I'm definitely on that list um, on it. So um, it's a matter of, we're just going to have to play by ear to see how statistically this works. I think it's just going to be valuable because, as I say, there are people out there that move into our county that don't realize dog licenses are required. Even though it's a state requirement, I still believe that people just don't realize it. And like I say, biggest argument they have, we forgot all about it. You know, oh, January 30th. First, it's, it's, it's not a date that anyone thinks about too much. Forget about it, stuff like that all the time. Hey. So, well, I'd, I'd love to have you come back and uh, kind of give us a report out on absolutely what discovered and how many you know negative calls you got, or whatever. I would love. I'll, I'll come back with that, and I'll actually come back because then I'll we'll have time where I can sit down and discuss the 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 new robocall will come out for people who did not license this year. So, uh, you guys will be aware when that's going to happen. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. There's no resolution, nothing we need to do other than just get it up there. No, you guys already gave the blessing. If you said no now, people are already getting called. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad we're not in the office to Sorry. take the uh, negative <laughs> Hopefully you guys don't get it at the commissioner's office a call. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to work. Did, so. did it have a return number listed with the football uh, call? It did, and it, it has the uh, the, uh, the otters. Phone number. <laughs> <laughs> it has his website address and it has our, our phone number. Yeah, if you have a problem with this, call the other. I think we had to put a robocall out. What do you think? <laughs> okay, Matt, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. All right, Jeff, let me see what you Great. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for, again, uh, uh, putting me on the agenda. As I just had uh, realized that there was one, I think, that I was not going to be able to get before you unless I got on the agenda tonight uh, because of the deadline of January uh, 31st for this uh, submission of this uh, grant. Um, so I'm, I know I submitted uh, some materials uh, to you regarding Title 20 funds and what we use them for and what they're permitted to be used for. Um, they're uh, approximately like last year, we received $187,000 and Title 20 funds, which we use for a number of different things. It's a fund that we've, um, an allocation that's come to us for a long, long time, and it comes to all job and family services that at least apply for it uh, throughout the state. And so it's, we have to submit it well ahead of time and get your blessing. It's one of the unique funding sources that we have that requires, um, you know, a signature. You know, you guys decide that usually comes from the board president, and we have to get our initial proposal now uh, then we have to have a public hearing in the spring, and then after the public hearing, hearing what the community uh, states or if people 
feel like they need more types of these funds, we can submit a different number uh, to the state. Um, but it's, again, it's a very important allocation. And what's unique about this allocation is we can actually use it for multiple, you know, multiple different things. So if we have something that's unique in a given per given year, we can use the monies um, more uniquely than some other um, allocations that we have that have strings attached. So it helps us uh, be a little bit more fluid um, you know, throughout the year. So if there's anything more you need for me, I'm happy to explain and prepare to explain to you further. Um, but I would just ask, this is actually less than we asked for the year before um, in the allocation. Um, it's actually what we got last year. Um, so that's really it. But it, this application is due uh, to the state January uh, 31st. And obviously, I didn't want to have a budget without $187,000 you know, $190,000 less than last year. And we used these funds, actually. Um, we used them in full last year. Okay. So, if I'm reading this application properly, each of the line items is associated with a dollar amount. That's what you're asking for. Yeah, yeah. at the end you'll see there's 187000 I think on the third page is the total amount. Um, they actually request how many people on average we expect to serve with that money is the top number and then the dollar amount and how we sort of anticipate that, that it'll be meted out through the different services that we've done historically. It's a pretty detailed, you know, budget. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. And, uh, the, the Department of Jobs and Family Services is requesting the board approve and authorize the president of the board to execute the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services Title 20 County Profiles for the period October 1st, 2015 through September 30th, 2016 and October 1st, 2016 through September 30th, 2017. So move. Second. Commissioner Rear. Aye. Commissioner Spillery. Aye. Commissioner Flipple. Aye. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Yeah. At some point next week, you can call and you have a question on this one. Absolutely. It's, there's a lot of information to it, so. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Did, uh, they ask you to stay for the next. You're going to stay for the next discussion. Is that okay? Pardon? Is that okay? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking you to because you're on the, you're a topic. So. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't asked, but uh, we, we can't talk about you behind your back, so we have to do it in front of the whole crowd. It's, okay. it's ugly, but that's what it is. Item is um, for uh, board schedules and for the um, other commissioners here. What we did today, and I had cooperation from Dave and Christy and Linda, was put together a schedule and, and a start for our policy and procedure manual for um, approved board members. And so what we did was we right now categorized um, appointments into two categories, board and, and advisory board, so there's different criteria associated with each of those. Um, I'm presenting this to you for your input and thoughts. This is a starting point. It is not the final document, just a rough draft, so that we can start the process of creating a policy for how we appoint uh, members to various boards. The second, that's the first page, and so this is a summary of all the boards that we appoint to that we know of. Um, and then on the second page are those that are before us that have some criticality to them, and I thought we would discuss those tonight. If we agree, then we can move forward on those and put those behind us. So, uh, any questions on conceptually on what, what I'm saying? Okay. Well, well, you point. have, on this list, you have a number of them. Am I... Guys are bad. Am I missing the law library on this list? Yes, I did notice that it was missing off of there. 
Uh, it was on there. I know I put it on there. Well, I know it's on the second uh, document. Mm -hmm. So, good catch. It's reason me everybody's eyes looking at it. So. But the intent is to create a comprehensive list of all the boards and ultimately to have the timing in here so that we know what's coming up and we're not going to be surprised and we can look out ahead and you know, be very proactive at uh, identifying who we're going to be appointing to various boards. And so for the purpose of the audience, uh, we have various board appointments, some of whom are advisory in nature, so they really don't direct the board. The mental health board, for example, the board members actually direct, they choose the director, they choose salaries, they create policy. Jobs and Family Services has a, an advisory board. They make uh, in, in, provide input and so forth, but there's no requirement to follow their advice. So we're trying to sort out um, how we go through the process, what's the best way to help uh, fulfill our requirement to find good people to fill the board boards and also uh, people that are going to uh, meet their responsibility and, and do the right things. So um, with that said, Jobs and Family Services, the planning committee, that's an advisory board, and there are currently 11 seats, is that correct, Greg, under consideration? Historically, there's... Why don't you come? Yeah, why don't you come? Come on down. I didn't want to scream. There historically has been uh, whoops, uh, 12 seats. Um, I had come up with, just because it was last minute, because uh, a lot of people either had left or was, we were looking at, in a different direction, we had 11, and then potentially, I mean, we were hoping to get back to 12. So, okay. so we correct this to 12. Um, it's been 12. For yeah. Us. yeah. Been 12. So you and I had talked the other day about an approach uh, just to filling these seats in that you would make recommendation to us yeah. because these are kind of specialized, unique needs in those seats. Uh, and then we could review those along with the criteria of the qualifications of the people you're recommending. Yes. And then we would either agree or not agree. Yeah. So in this, in this particular case, if that's agreeable between the two of you, then we could use that as our starting policy on this. Craig can follow through. We'll say you've got two weeks to do that, and we'll, we'll complete this in two weeks. Oh, easily. Because um, I already have around 11 people that I very qualified. And if you look at the statute that sets up the Family, Family Planning Services Committee, it sort of gives a guide or a suggestion as to who should potentially be serving on this. Mm -hmm. So we've historically and currently with me, I've tried to follow that guide so it's representative of the people that sort of JFS touches their their lives or their organizations. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the thought behind that because we, we want them to understand what we do so if they have suggestions on how we can do it better or what have you uh, more efficiently, then you know they have credibility coming to that because they understand what we do. And how many of the, I mean, you have all these names put together at this point in time for... Uh, I have 11 names as of now. Yes. Okay, good. So, and, and along with their qualifications. That's what you originally. Yeah, that is correct. I would suggest we put this on the fast track because we, they were supposed to be seated on January 1 of this year. So they've already missed a, a month of the time. <laughs> yeah, they haven't missed a meeting yet. I think our first one is... February 12th. Okay. So we could actually, if, if that's okay, we could probably put this on the agenda next week and get yes, behind it. So is that's that right. I, think I, I, think I, I think I can get one additional person to, it's volunteer, there's no money, you know, that comes with a fast salary. It's, it meets four times a year, and actually it's not a bad place to talk about it because people watch the, you know, but it's individuals uh, that want to serve on a committee that are the board or the, the committee that's, you know, meets four times a year and it's sort of listens to what we do and we get statistics of all the numbers in all the different divisions and then they ask questions, it's sort of an open uh, forum and then they have the opportunity if they feel to suggest something to, to you, the commissioners, I mean the point of the board or the committee is to actually serve the commissioners as well as JFS in um, saying, you know, they are doing their job, they're not doing their job, they could be doing their job better, they can offer us, us that advice or Say, we're doing a great job. So it's really, it's an advisory, and it's just to make sure and keep holding us accountable mm -hmm. and has the opportunity to uh, submit reports to the Board of Commissioners if uh, they think it's necessary. Can you give me the names and everything so I can tweak in the ear so that I can get them to beat you up a little bit? Yeah, that's okay. Got thick skin. Yeah, good.
Uh, is that okay with you, Ralph? Are you yeah, good with that? Okay. So we'll uh, we'll try and get this fast track, and uh, I'll take a look at it uh, uh, probably tomorrow and see what you've got submitted. I mean, do we have the qualifications for the folks? Do we have those? I uh, know a number of them have submitted resumes at the request of uh, the board. I don't know if I've gotten everyone. I have gotten everyone good. So um, this whole stack is you. All right. And this was given to all of you. Okay. Good. So we well, have the list here. Um, this, everything that I scanned to you um, was all of the applications and resumes that I had received for the ones that you asked to be reappointed and the new ones that you asked to be appointed of those 11 of the 12. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, we'll, we'll move that and get that. And I'll try to get the one additional person so we get back up to 12. Good. We'll get that up for a plate then. All right. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Oh, you too. Thank you. Um, let's move to pass the knock cog real quick uh, to eat to an easy one. The Western Reserve, we talked about this actually the other day. Um, we're not paying dues. We don't attend those meetings. Really, the Soil and Water Department is the folks who really select those members. Um, so we had talked about withdrawing from that organization and just not being involved with that board. Is that acceptable to you guys? If so, if so we'll look at those. Move on. Is that okay? Now, which one are you? One is on the West RC and D. Yeah, right there. There's, there's no more. Well, I think we still have to read a resolution. We're going we're to have to vote on it. Right, right, right. That's what I'm suggesting. If, if you're okay with it, then we'll, we'll make a resolution and move on. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, we to vote on it, and then we vote how we want. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion? So moved. Second. Um, can I have a confirmation of what we're actually the Yeah, I don't have anything the, written down. The motion is to withdraw from the um, RC&D, um, which, as I already said, we don't really, we've not really been participating uh, in that in any case over the last I don't know how long they Well, I mean, the commissioners, I think, joined it in 1989, and we, the, the commissioners have not paid their dues, at least since in the 10 years I've been with the board. So, and they always have the meetings when you're having commissioner sessions, so it's not convenient for any of the commissioners to go, so we're not active. So I think you're, you're looking at an action to simply withdraw from that group or send them a letter of your intention to withdraw. I'm not sure what kind of legal process they might ask for. They might ask for the resignation that comes if that's what the board does in some particular form. We haven't paid for this in a decade? At, le at least. We didn't get a late notice? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so what would the proper procedure be, do you think? Should we send them a letter or should we Well, I think you, if you, you, I think you take action tonight expressing the, you know, the board's you know, decision whether or not they would want to withdraw, and then Christy would write a, a confirmation letter, and then we just ask mm -hmm. them, please advise us as to whatever procedure we have to follow to complete this withdrawal from the organization. Okay. So my motion is to withdraw from this organization and to draft the appropriate letter to communicate to them. I just see if there's any issues with that. And uh, so that's the motion on the table. So we well, we already had a, did you do it before? Are we going to, I mean, I, you moved and he seconded already. Is it the same? It's basically the same. They just refined sure. it in terms of the letter that yeah. they've suggested. Yeah, then we call it roll. Okay, so. Commissioner Rear? Yes. Commissioner Spillery? Aye. Commissioner Claypool? Aye. Okay, so. Okay, so the, um, let's do the law library next. We have a number of uh, <laughs> resumes for the law library. I know that there's some interest in getting that wrapped up and getting that seat filled. Um, I think we have, what, four? Five now. Five now? Yeah, the one just came in, right? Uh, yeah. I, I know of one other one, someone that's qualified that was interested in submitting. We'd probably get that in the next day or so. Now, most of these are coming through referral, right? We didn't put a published notice. No, up there we did not put referral. a published notice. And probably the proper procedure or the proper way to handle this particular one, because, again, it's unique. It's not really open. It's not the kind of thing we would open to the public generally, because it's kind of, kind of it has a unique requirement or not. Uh, well, I think, you know, the, the commissioners had, when, when this, the change in law you know, uh, brought about 
the last appointment that was done uh, in the term that just ended, and that individual is a township trustee for Newberry. So, you know, I mean, she has a business background, but uh, other than she works in a local political subdivision, I don't know of a specific thing that would tie her necessarily. So, so what I hear is you can be on this board and not be an attorney. Yes. But is there a limit? I mean, can, is there one member that's not an attorney and the others are attorneys or something along that line? Uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I can't, I can't that understand that. The position is open was, was not an attorney. Lawyer. I don't think you're precluded from making an attorney this time. Yeah, I know the one that's going off is not an attorney. But I don't know, you know, sometimes on these boards you got three, right. three that are attorneys and there may there may be a minimum requirement where you have to have you know some minimum representation by attorneys. And the and the this board basically just oversees the management of the law library. Correct. Because they have their own separate fund now on top of it. So uh, unless there's a, a disagreement, um, I would just suggest we take a look at the resumes we have. Um, maybe uh, open this up for one more week for anybody who wants to reach out there. So at the end of next week, we'll put a closure to this, and then the following week, we'll put it on the agenda and vote on it. Be like, well, okay. yeah, wait a minute. How long in the week where you don't have a meeting? You do not have a meeting on the table. We have a meeting next Tuesday. Following Tuesday, we don't have a meeting. So you're looking at about the 17th before it would be on, correct? I mean, this is a case where they already have a quorum. You're not stopping them. You know, family services planning, you had to act because they're going to have a meeting. What's the date? The 3rd. Uh, we have a meeting. On the 26th. Okay. Oh. We have one on the 24th at 9 and then on the 26th. So we, we just want to put this on the agenda and we'll put closer to it on the 24th. 24th of February? Sure. Sorry for that. I mean, if you bump the microphone with your paper, it makes that kind of a racket. So we'll just put this on for the 24th. I mean, the, theoretically, we can put it on the agenda even. Just two of us are here, but... Well, we'll get input from all of you, so I think, you know, hopefully you can come to consensus on whoever you pick, whether if there's just two commissioners here to do it. So we'll put that for the time being. Um, the Planning Commission... Um, we have a number of resumes at this point in time. I'd like to, to see us make public notice on that. And so um, I think that the procedure is uh, one public notice with the website involved, correct? Right? I'm not sure. I think that, well, the planning commission did a notice, but you're saying you want to do a second one under They did do a public notice? Oh, yeah, yeah. They, they, yeah. Did. they did. They oh, okay. did advertise. Yeah. Well, um, we ought to probably take a look. How many resumes do we currently have? Well, Christy Scott. Six. Two that wanted to be re reconsidered. Correct. And I thought there were four more tonight. Was there five? I know there were four. Well, I know some other individuals have called me and asked um, what the procedure was, and so I told them to send us a letter and the resume, and so I know those should be forthcoming. So we might give this another week, and then also. Well, that's the other thing about this procedure that I. I find a little problem, you know, troubling is uh, that we advertise for for uh, resumes, applications for some of these boards with no ending date until filled. Well, that doesn't do us any favors, I don't think. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're going to end up waiting two or three weeks and then appointing somebody and somebody's going to have theirs in the next day and yell at us and say, well, you waited for three weeks and now you, you I got gypped. I think there needs to be a finish line on those things. I don't know. What, I'm not saying it's a week or two weeks or three weeks. I just think there has to be a, if you don't get it in by this date, it's not considered. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Actually, I agree with you, Blake. Um, and that's the reason for putting together a policy slash procedure manual. Up until this point, we haven't had one. And so now we That's what I'm saying. I, and so we'll define one, and then going forward, we won't have to go through this again and again. So with this one planning commission seats, because we've been kind of loose-goosey here. There's two seats. So.
um, or two seats, I'm sorry. So if we just wait another week, we've got some resumes in, then we can put closure to it and we move on, if, that, if that's okay. Okay, the, um, let's go back up to NACCOG. Um, Blake, you're the one that has the most experience with that since you sit on that board. And yeah. so um, <laughs> what is your suggestion in terms of how we should proceed on this? Because these are kind of unique candidates, I think. So yes. can you give me your thoughts on it? Well, the board I sit on, you're on there because you're one of the commissioners in the three counties that make it up. And so we're, you know, we approve the finances and financials and do that stuff. Then they break down into a number of individual work groups boards, if you will, and uh, I've watched people that come up and say, I want to volunteer on this or I want to volunteer on that. I don't really get into how that those jobs are filled. I would imagine you would check with Craig Turner and, uh, and he'd be more knowledgeable about it than me. I mean, I just see it going on. I don't well, can, yeah. I, can I add something? Yeah. I mean, the spreadsheet, I think, you know, because we've had a number of these documents floating around. There's one spreadsheet that I was looking at when I wrote up a summary. There's a total of 33 members, 11 from each county. And then there's the three commissioners. Those are the LEOs, local elected officials. And of our 11, can or 11 slots to be filled, there's supposed to be representation from business and government. And if that one spreadsheet that we have around here somewhere kind of lays out what there is. What we're looking for, education, I think. Yeah, because the whole idea this is this is for distribute distribution of workforce investment act money. So we're trying to bring the stakeholders to the table that can identify what the job training needs are in our county. Okay, right now there's four available seats. Craig, you want to come back up? <laughs> you should have sat front row. That's you right. just sat in the front row. You so, yeah, I tried to, you know. I, 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 do you have strong yeah, feelings on this one way or the other? Well, I mean, again, Marco uh, Rita is the specific person I, I would rely upon in answering that question. Uh, she has got great experience, and she attends all these meetings and goes on. Um, so I do believe that input from the agency is, is, is a good thing, you know, and from her and who she's, she, she, I mean, she's so well uh invested in the community and all the partners and stuff, so I, I at least think a uh, discussion with her, um, you know, is, is an important thing to have. Do we have names already in the pipeline for these? I would imagine we do. Because yes. what I saw in the matrix the other day was that they were vacant and I didn't see any names in those. Okay. Well, so. I can make, I, tomorrow, I can make inquiry of that uh, specifically and get an answer to you tomorrow. Okay, so why don't we set this aside for the time being until we get with Margo or whatever? Mm -hmm. and, right, um, my, my thoughts on that. There's a lot of people. Well, Margo knows, okay, there's people that are missing. Mm -hmm. Well, the people that are still there have some expertise. Absolutely. We're trying to find someone to replace somebody who had an expertise and left. Correct. We don't need to add, you know, two people with the same. Yeah, no, I think they try to have a diversification. Right, of, and uh, she'd know that. that we way. wouldn't. And yet, well, and she'd know, again, she's so tied in with the... Right. With, Again, the educa edu education side, the job training side, the business side, um, so, and, you know, just all the different partners that provide services in the community. Um, so I, I definitely think uh, advice from her, insight from her is, should be welcome. Okay, so with this particular one, from a standard standpoint, um, again, you guys are very closely in tune with what the needs are. Yes, sir. And yet we have some responsibility to ensure that, mm -hmm. that there's a check and balance there, so to speak. And so um, why don't you arrange a meeting with Margo and we'll talk about the unique needs for those four individuals so we can get those off display mm -hmm. and then we'll we'll establish the proper plan to move forward and get those filled. Absolutely. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to set this aside temporarily. Um, who has responsibility for the Jug County Care Housing Board? I need to think that's me. There's one seat to fill. Correct. It's a reemployment. Oh, that's, that's right. Who was that individual? It was Betty Kimbrew. Betty. You know, she's representing bank, you know, she's a banker, so she's right. representing that group of stakeholders. But again, that's not, that's not necessary for a quorum. There's nothing, 
no burning bush here in terms no. of getting this bill. No. So I can set up a meeting with Anita and, and kind of get right. a take on it. Does anybody have any strong feelings about this? No. If not, then um, we'll delay this one until I talk to Anita, and then we'll come up with a time frame so we can get this off the plate. The objective is to get these all off our plate. Right. And, uh, and then to establish a proper procedure going forward so that what Blake said was going to be true. We have a process that we can click through and do the right things. Okay, good. Unless there's anything else, we put that behind us. Are we, are we good with all that? Anybody? I'm good. Cool. Okay, that brings us up to the next and last agenda item. Before we get into uh, that, just which is a presentation, um, does anybody have any questions, comments? No? Okay. So, with that said, then, unless there's objection, I'll start the presentation. Um, and the mic's up there. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Do I need to use the mic? The other one. The other presentation. There were two PowerPoints at the bottom. It is me. to set the stage. And can you hear me okay? Do I need to use this? Okay. Um, we've had some discussions about NOAC. And there's been a number of things happening with that organization. And so we had talked in the last meeting about having a in informational forum or discussion on this organization. Um, I've asked Kim Lorry, who is the ultimate for Roscoe Larry, who sit in the last Nilaka meeting to come in and, and participate. So we, uh, she provided some input on the presentation. Um, and I want to make a couple of things clear. First of all, this is not an attack on Nilaka. This is a, an opportunity for us to discuss, to take the mask off a little bit and to discuss some of the realities of what we're working with. Um, things are not always as they seem when you go to the NOACA meeting, or when you just are discussing this organization. So this is in no way intended to be a, um, an attack on this organization. It is educational to show you from their documents, from their material, what they're about. Few people look below, behind the curtain to understand what's going on. And, I, and it's, I thought it was important for everybody to see some of what's behind the curtain. Because you hear rhetoric, but sometimes you don't. It's like reading the, did you read the bill to find out what was in it before you passed it? Well, this is kind of that. And so we'll, we'll talk about a number of things. We'll move somewhat rapidly. Um, you're welcome to ask questions at any point. So, our objective is to provide uh, perspective, insight, and some context. Who is uh, NOACA? They're a federally designated metropolitan planning organization governed by a federal law called MAP 21, but organized under the state of Ohio. So, the federal government says we've got to have them, but they don't say how they have to be organized. The NOACA organization is unique in the state of Ohio in that it is a council of governments. Most of the other MPOs are simply an extension to the planning organizations in their respective areas. AMAS, for example, is simply an extension of the planning organization that exists in Summit County. They're responsible for regional, what they will say is, they're responsible for regional transportation and environmental planning. I want to underline, this is what they will tell you. Um, they're responsible for preparing long-range transportation plans, short-range transportation improvement plans, and prioritizing the use of federal dollars, for the most part. Their funding sources are these. I'm not going to dwell on those, but basically federal dollars. And by the way, 
Most of the dollars that they deal with are the 18 cents a gallon gas tax that we provide. There's also 28 cents a gallon, which is an Ohio state tax that goes to the state of Ohio. The state of Ohio has a constitutional amendment that dictates very clearly and straightforwardly how that 28 cents a gallon is to be spent. We're going to talk about that because that was discussed last Friday in the meeting. We pay out, and I can show you my calculation, about $260 million a year in gas tax dollars combined Ohio and federal. We get back about um, 26. So we pay out 260. 10%. And we get back a very small percentage of that. We pay out about 10 million in federal gas tax, and we pay out about 16 million in Ohio state tax. At the federal level, we get back about two. At the state level, we get back about four. Who's we? We, the people from Jogger County. And I can show you how the calculation is done. When uh, Noack was in here with the ODOT guy, My Myron Popkish, their calculation, they did it in a different way, but we came up with very similar numbers. Could you please repeat those numbers once again? Sure. We pay out about Jogger County. Jogger County. Jogger County residents. Right. And people will say, well, you drive around, you drive to Montana, you drive to Florida, whatever, you're buying gas. My approach on this, my um, thought on this was, I don't care where I'm buying the gas, I live in Geauga County. Any federal tax dollars that I'm paying into the system, I want to return to Geauga County. And so I'm a resident of Geauga County, and I'm any federal gas tax dollars that I'm paying, same thing would go from Florida, whatever state you happen to be in, that's just the way that I think. Those dollars should return to the county that you're, you live in, that you reside in. Okay, I wanted to have a quick, brief conversation about the difference between regionalism and collaboration, because you're going to hear a lot of discussion about regionalism. Regionalism is a centralized, um, bureaucratic organization that's established, that's unelected for the most part, not accountable. Versus collaboration, where you have communities come together, there's an agreement on how you're going to share things, and then you do that by contract. It doesn't create an unaccountable situation for the electorate. In my mind, that's the distinction between the two. Regionalism, and NOAC is a perfect example of that. We have three votes on a panel of 44. Well, there's a lot of elected officials. That 44 are all, for the most part, they're elected officials. We only have three votes. We can't control, we, we can't hold accountable the representatives from Cleveland, Lorain, Lake County. They're unaccountable elected officials to us. So we only have three votes. Which way do you think the votes are going to go? Why do we only have three votes? Well, as they decided to create the what they call the Code of Regulations, which governs that organization, the Council on Governments, they did it by population, and we have a smaller population, and so that's the long and the short. Now, we have recently, last week, put in a resolution for them asking for the minimum standard to be a county engineer and three commissioners. Every other county, there's five counties, every county <coughs> has at least a county engineer and three representatives in the equation. We're the only county that does not. And so... Population formula aside, we'd ask them to, as the minimum standard, the starting point, include our county engineer, and it's only fair. If we increase it by one vote, we still lose by 43 votes. So it's really no skin off their chest. It's important, though, for our county engineer to be at the table because he's the most important person in the room. And if you're watching, Joe, I think that. Um. So go ahead. So why wasn't our county engineer one of our three appointed? We're not given by code of regulation, their bylaws that control us, we're allowed three commissioners. We're not allowed to change that. Um, we asked, we last year passed a resolution to allow two commissioners and an engineer, but they didn't approve it. So the code of regulation dictates. Now, I'm going to show you a slide coming up. There, This is just an example of what we're working with with NOACA. This is just the reality. They're, they're a reality we have to work with. We can't do away with them. They're just the reality of who we have to work with. Their code of regulations determines how we operate. Their code of regulations say that the president of the board gets to tell us who's representing us in their 
board. And so I don't like it, but that's their code of regulations. Go ahead, Nancy. So am I understanding that each one of you can go to an OACA meetings together or your alternates? Yes. And it's my understanding that we could have chosen our engineer as an alternate and that was not that was not done, correct? That's correct. And why would that happen? <coughs> What's that? Why? why would that not happen? Good question. Um, it happened for a variety of reasons as we were all considering Making alternate or alternate appointments and so forth. Now, keep in mind, in my case, I attend all the meetings, and so my alternate is, who happens to be Linda Brahini, is um, kind of immaterial. I might miss a meeting or two. Um, I selected Linda, um, thinking based on a prearrangement that we had discussed about, and not in violation of Sunshine Law, by the way. I have a, I had a. Uh, Grace period in which I could talk to the other two commissioners. And so there was some discussion about alternates and who was going to be selected and so on and so forth. And so there was not, there was a thought that Joe would be worked into the equation. In my case, it didn't make any difference. Linda's been employed by the county for 10 years. She's experienced as an alternate. She serves as an alternate with uh, Tracy and with Mary and and a number of other elected officials. She knows NOACA, she knows the procedure, she knows the county, she serves our county well, and she and I see eye to eye relative to what we want to do. And the most important thing, sorry, the most important thing for, at least in my perspective, for an alternate, is that you have somebody who will represent your thoughts and your beliefs and your values yes, at I that table. That. And so, so, anyway, I can't speak to other choices. I can speak to my choice. and. That was the reason that I made my choice, and so. Um, I was at the meeting last week, but it was my understanding that that as far as the sequence went, um, Blake chose, and then you chose, and then Mr. Spinelli chose. Or you chose first. I think I chose first. Okay. Yeah. So Mr. Spinelli chose last, and he could have chose Mr. Patel, and so mm -hmm. he chose Miss Lori, mm -hmm. who does not reside in our county and who was just newly employed by our county. So I, I'm asking Mr. Scalari, why did you not choose Mr. Patel? Well, I had already, uh, you know, predetermined prior to entering the meeting that uh, that I was going to choose Kim Laurie based on the fact that she's she grew up in Geauga County. Her parents still live in Geauga County. She spent the majority of her life in Geauga County, went to school in Geauga County. Um, she works for Geauga County, where that was a, that was a big... Uh, question about a year and a half ago that um, NOACA was trying to get something where we had to have some either an employee of the county or elected official of the county. And at the end of the day, it comes down to is, is that I, after speaking with Kim and, and, and kind of just watching throughout the uh, entire trail of, of her uh, candidacy as, uh, as a commissioner that she was also running in Lake County, Lake County for, um, we share a lot of the same values and, and, and views. So at the end of the day, I don't think it's a matter of what part of the, um, you know, appointment process we were in, whether I was first, second, or third, that was the determination that I was going to make. And, and to be quite honest with you, I mean, Sunshine Law is here and it's, uh, and it's, uh, and, it, and it is what it is. So there, I don't get a chance to talk to Blake or Skip and, Say you know who are you choosing or who are you choosing? It's it's one of those situations that um, we don't have that luxury. So at that point, my whole thought process was is, is that I had spoken to the engineer a couple of weeks prior to that meeting that he basically had explained to me that he felt that and was actually going to discuss with Commissioner Rear that he would be the alternate. So I felt comfortable and confident that that was, was already taken care of as, as in the past that I know that just in the year that I've served with, with Commissioner Rear that he liked that, that setting at that point. I never heard any discontention of any issues of that in the past. So it was something that I just basically assumed that that was just as simple as it was going to be. And when I heard it was um, Mary Smitty, I, at that point, I wasn't going to change my position because I knew that, you know, I, I chose Kim for the reasons that I just explained to you, and, and I'll defend it, you know, to, to the end here. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Can I ask you how many meetings you've attended since you've been a commissioner? Two. Two in two, two. years. Two in two years. I, I attended one to vote against the um, bike trail funding that I believe you um, had, 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 had involvement with the city of Chardon to bring in the bike trail for the uh, funding of that, almost a half a million dollars. And uh, so I went to ask for them to please reconsider that and put the money into roads that so many people need. And <clears throat> obviously I couldn't even get a second with that with the uh, group because they are very, very versed in that auxiliary uh, point of, uh, of of travel, you know, that, they're, that they believe that uh, that is the thing of the future. And I don't think too many people just like on a night like tonight in Ohio are probably using bike trails, but I guarantee you they're using roads tonight. So it's my, my priority was is safety on roads, having good road conditions to save lives. And, and that's so I was at that meeting, and I was at the second meeting that there were uh, there was another important vote that I felt that I I wanted to make sure that uh, that I, I was I was heard at. So, but in that situation also, I, I I delegated that responsibility with Skip as my alternate prior to that for the past two years that that you know flawlessly represented this county and and flawlessly represented what my views were, and any meeting that he went to, we had a long discussion prior to him going to the meeting, and when he came back to discuss, you know, what the agenda was and what the uh, um, outcomes I would I would like to see. So we had great communication, and, and he's passionate. He's got the, the you know, the, the drive to be involved, and he takes it serious. And I couldn't ask for a better representative during those two years than, than what Skip did. And, and let me add to my two cents worth on this, because I've known Miss Lori for a number of years now, and she serves this county well. She has a, her family lives here, and um, she is now employed here, and I've observed her on the, in the meeting that we had, and she's attended those meetings. I don't know how many people in this room regularly attend the NOACA meetings, when you don't have to, when you're not being paid to, and you know, people don't want you there, and, uh, and and she has been doing a very good job at, first of all, building an understanding of what that organization is all about, and secondly, representing the principles and values that I think are important to defend this county. So do you plan on being at any other NOAC meetings, or you're just going to put your alternate to that in your place? Um, you know, I, I can't answer that. I, I, I don't know at this point, you know. I'll, I'll watch the agenda that's coming up, and I'll, I'll just see what the uh, current current events are coming up. But if it's something that I feel that there's a, there's, a, there's a special need that I need to be there, I'll be there, no problem. If it's a situation, if I didn't, if I didn't feel comfortable with my alternate, then, then I would never have chosen it. I would have remained that position open. This is uh, something that I address to all three of you. As a resident of this county for 25 years, I would appreciate that any future appointments not be given, Mr. Rear, to an individual that the majority of Geauga County voters has voted out of office repeatedly. That is not an appropriate appointment in the eyes of many, many people. And Mr. Claypool and Mr. Spillary, I hear your arguments, and I too have a high regard for Kim Lord. Mm -hmm. However, she is not a resident of our county. And, you know, I'm working full-time for a Middlefield business right now, and Middlefield would no more put me on their city council because I work there than that I think you should have put people from outside our county in those appointed seats. So I just would like to register those concerns uh, and to have, hopefully have you take those kind of you know, considerations into mind in future appointments. Clearly, I guess, you know, the horse is out of the barn. Uh, but it's very, very disappointing. Well, let, let me respond to that a little bit. Um, and, and I'm going to defend Linda and to some degree Kim. 
But um, it is important, I mean, traditionally, the, the qualification has been generally somebody who's been employed. If you reach out to somebody within the office, you want somebody within the office you know. And there aren't, you know, there are a variety of people we have in our office. Very um, few of them have the right attributes to be able to go to that board, and you can trust them at that board to make the right decisions and make the right calls. Linda, while she doesn't live here in Jogger County, she serves this county admirably. She's done it for ten years. There's no, there's nobody who lives in this county that probably would do as good a job as Linda sitting at that board. Now, she will never attend those meetings. So, <laughs> sorry, Linda, but. That, that's just the deal. But so when you're thinking about it, if you're in an elected position, you want to pick an alternate. The most important criteria is that you have somebody who will represent your view at those tables, and you'll represent the people in Jaga County. So I respect what you say. I think it's really important. You know, I could have, in reflection, I guess, gotten somebody from uh, Joe's office to be my alternate, but they wouldn't attend either. So I would have solved, not solved that particular problem there. But just, I'm going to ask you to think about that. When we're thinking through who we're going to select, at least from my perspective, I want to select somebody who's going to best represent my views at that table. And trust me, my views are what best protects the, the values of this county, what can best protect this county. As, as I said to Kim Lurie when I walked in here, this is not about her, and I don't even know Linda. It's not about you know a statement against her. Mm -hmm. I would love to see Kim Lurie appointed for Lake County so she would be an ally for the three measly seats that our county get, gets. But, you know, she's not available for her own county because she's on our county. Mm -hmm. So, I, I just, I believe it's poor judgment and in the case of Mary Samidi, I am offended and appalled. Can I define myself? <laughs> Sorry. Um, since I'm sitting here, I might as well join the conversation. First of all, I'm not on the board for Lake County because nobody offered me the alternative. Mm -hmm. okay, so being a representative um, for Geauga County is not preventing me from being an ally for Lake County. If somebody there had asked me to be that alternative, I wouldn't be happy to do so. But in Lake County, all three of our commissioners are Democrats, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is, like Skip mentioned, I did grow up here. And I actually lived here about 25 years. so. I would say you and I have equal experience with Geauga County. It wasn't for I don't want the job. Well, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, just because I don't currently live here anymore, how is it that that must mean that I have forgotten everything I ever knew? And I learned for 25 that. years of my life. You did hear me when I came in, and I said that it's not about you as a person. It's about the decision-making process mm -hmm. and recognizing the residents of this county. And I would hope that somehow, out of the tens of thousands of residents we have, that we would have some people that were competent within the county. But the message is that we don't. Well, that, that's not the message at all. I mean, we, and I don't make this about the altering this, this whole meeting. I've got a lot of stuff to show you, which might help you to adjust your thinking a bit. But um, this is about having the right people at the table. And there, and you know this. There are very few people who will make the commitment of time to build the knowledge necessary to do the right things at that board. And there are certain elected officials who are live in this county who do not make the right decisions at that board. And so it is so important that we get the right people who are willing to make the principled stands and apply the value and, yeah, tilt the windmills a little bit because that's the only way things will change. What I see in that board are nothing but rubber stampers. The people that are really leading that board are the, the unelected bureaucrats, who we can't change. We have no impact over, and the director just got a huge increase to $180,000 a year. When she brings things to the board, they rubber stamp those, and they move on. I am appalled at that. And so we need people who are willing to stand up and at least challenge the system, at the very least, you need to challenge some of the things that are being done so people start thinking a little bit and don't just rubber stamp everything that comes to the board. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, two questions real quick. Um, <coughs> is there ever a chance in NOACA, I'm just learning more about NOACA now, mm -hmm. and learn more as much as I can about it, would there ever be an opportunity where Lake County would have a, be in competition for a grant money to Jogger County, mm -hmm. and would these two may vote for uh, Lake County for their own court, if you will? Would that ever come up in NOACA? Well, I, 
I can speak to that. Um, it's not a matter of competing for grant money. It's the fundamental ideology behind what they're doing. And when I'm standing up in opposition to what they're doing, I'm helping Jaguar County just as much as I'm helping Lake County. I'm not sitting there saying, yeah, we need more money in Lake County or we need more money in Jaguar County. That's not what these conversations are about. And as, as he gets farther along in the presentation, there are actually audio clips where you can hear the various arguments that we yeah, let, let's uh, let's move through the presentation. We can come back to this. I mean, I don't have any problem. Stay and stick around. The other commissioners, I, if they want to leave, that's fine. That's up to them. One more quick question. Real quick. Real okay. Quick. Oh, Lorraine, up. I think Lorraine County. Correct me if I'm wrong. They have three commissioner positions: fair housing, maybe a transportation, and one of the commissioners it says county commissioner slash county engineer. Mm -hmm. How does that work? And they have two commissioners. And either commissioner or an engineer? You know, I, I was not here when the original code of regulations were drafted, although I have asked for the historical documents, all the agreements, uh, and so forth, and which was provided to me last year after a lot of controversy um, because they didn't want to give those documents up. What are the agreements that we've signed? What are the policies that we have in place? What's the history behind this? Because that, that tells me what it is we've committed to over the years. You know, I've come into this somewhat late to the game. This began decades ago. And so there's a lot of history as this has evolved. Skip, Bob, as far as you're, you're asking Lorraine County, so so with, what happens is some of these counties have some of the municipalities. Like currently for, for Lorraine County, you have um, Holly Brinda, which is the mayor of uh, Illyria. You've got Ken Carney, who is their engineer. You've got Richard Heidecker, who's a Columbia Township trustee. You've got John D. Hunter, who was the mayor of Sheffield Village. You've got Ted, Ted Kalo, who's the county commissioner. Um, you've got Chase Rittenauer, which is the mayor of Lorraine. And then you've got, to be determined, another commissioner. So in that in that mix, they do have, they've got a, a, the engineer and they've got two, tr two commissioners, which they probably decided to put one as the commissioner as in there rather than, than having, or the uh, engineer rather than having the My question the is that the county or Noaka decided that? Noaka decided that. And well, so the, each, uh, each county is somewhat different. I, I, for I, don't think so. yes. I think that the county could have decided that. The commissioners the, the commissioners just probably decided that their choice, just like we had it last year where we had two commissioners and an engineer involved, you know, down there as far as that, because they've got two commissioners and then their engineer in here. Well, that, that, that was that was taken in the code of regulations. Right. Got the the code of regulations dictates to us that we have three commissioners. Medina County has three seats, they actually have four seats, and they get to determine who fills the four seats. It doesn't have to be three commissioners. Can, in their case, they have a city councilman, they have a commissioner, they have their engineer, and so the code of regulations was drafted differently for each of the participating communities. And actually, Cleveland over the years has been offended because they didn't have enough. They said. And so they had kept adding people. So there's marriage representatives in the port of port authority, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, I mean, I can't speak to the rationale behind that. At some point in time, we capitulated or said it was okay. We wanted three commissioners and not our county engineer, but we just passed a resolution that was voted on unanimously that we wanted to have our county engineer on the, at the table. Now, I will say, after saying that, I'll say this: one of the most important committees for our uh, engineer to be on, the transportation committee, he's on. So if you want to know where the projects get into the system, that's the committee that they get into the system. And Joe sits on that committee. He's got other um, uh, engineer individuals, Nick, and some other people on some of the other subcommittees. Those are, that's really where the work gets done. The board, which I sit on, and uh, some of the other committees, they're nice to go to. Um, there's a lot of banter going around, but it's a rubber stuff panel. When you want to look at really where the work gets done, it's down there in those subcommittees, and Joe's in those subcommittees. Now, it'd be nice to have him at the board level that we're at, because then he could speak to some of the other things that are going on within some of the other um, counties and so forth. But I'll say, speaking to your question about is there a conflict, generally speaking, when we're looking at the projects at the board level, it's a summary of projects and a list of projects, and you vote wholesale on that list of projects. And so we're not going to, we don't pick the county's project out of there. That's done down at the subcommittee level. We're voting wholesale on groups of projects. 
If I could add one more thing also, is let's say, for example, we have a situation or scenario that comes up that we really feel that the engineer needs to be down there for that date. We still reserve the right at the meeting, you know, on Tuesday to decide to say, you know, we feel that, that you know, the engineer needs to go on our behalf and speak on this because this, this, and this is coming up. And we have the ability to say, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're going to replace, uh, you know, put our alternate in as Joe Cattell for the engineer's office. And, and then he sits on there, you know, for whoever would make that decision. So if there was a critical issue or, or you know, need that, that we saw like that, you know, and, and fortunately enough, we've got a great engineer in this county who, who has great communication with, with us. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think we're all looking out for the best interest of Geauga County. And, and our engineer is definitely one of them, too. And and I, I think that if there's a situation like that that's really, you know, going to take front stage, that he's going to do that, you know, he's going to approach us to say, I need to, need to have a voice in, in this. And I don't think that, I know I have no problem. I'm sure Blake doesn't have a problem, and I'm sure Skip wouldn't have a problem if that would, if that would come up. Because at the end of the day, our interest is Geauga County. Yeah, there, there is nobody, and I'm speaking for the other two individuals, there's nobody on this board, as much as we banter and struggle and all that kind of stuff, there is nobody on this board that doesn't want the best thing for this county. And so, and we're working through that, and, and for elected officials, Nancy and, and folks in this room, this is how the sausage gets made. It's ugly. The good news is, this is out in the open. I mean, I, I can make comments on a different way, a different approach. This is... We're not afraid to get in front of you and have these tough discussions because it's important that you understand where we're coming from and we can banter it out and then maybe you'll change our minds on some things. And so, go ahead. So, is it my understanding that we could choose to have two commissioners and our engineer because we have the three seats? No. That's not. We have three commissioners, that's the way the bylaws are written today. Okay. Now, that, what uh, yeah, Ralph was talking about is we, we, for certainly we confer with Joe, he's in the room. And, you know, so we're going to be, he'll be speaking through us. It is a challenge, and I will rest assured, there are things in the works. And I ain't going to talk about it now. It's being filmed, and I don't want to get the cat out of the bag. But there's stuff in the works that, to make changes. And that's yeah. what we're trying to just put, you know, where they could, you know, set us up like, you know, like, like Lake County is to just have our engineer in there also, you know. So we'll have four seats. Not that that's really going to make an impact on their voting, because... We're still going to be outnumbered, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it would be nice to be able to just have that fourth spot. And it, yeah. So okay. That, let's get. So we can move forward. Go ahead, Blake, and then let's move forward with the presentation. Go ahead. Something that I think a lot of people may be overlooking. We passed a week ago a resolution for all three commissioners and the engineer. Right. We did that before last year. All right. A similar resolution. Well, we did it both. It was almost identical. No, we did we did one and then we did another one. Mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me of the why buy the cow and milk is free. Why are they going to give us a fourth seat if the engineer's sitting on there? Well, so I mean, on the board, no, we want no. I mean, on the board, if you got two commissioners and the and the, and the engineer mm -hmm. taking those three seats. Mm -hmm. What's the incentive to give us a third commissioner? To be fair? Well, no, yeah, right. And so, right. We, you're absolutely right, Blake, and again, I don't want to get into the yeah, details. Yeah, I'm just saying. But there's stuff in the works to provide the big stick. I mean, and so. If, if you want the engineer on there, mm -hmm. and you automatically put him on, those people aren't going to say, well, let's change the, the code of regulations. He's already here. So he, yeah, he's not. I mean, I'm confused with the question a little bit, but yeah. no, I understand what he's saying. He's saying if we if we have if we have Joe as our alternate, and then so the engineer is there, and we were you know we take a back seat to say we're going to put two commissioners in the engineer. Well, now we're asking him. So the, at the end of the day, like he's saying, you guys are to bring your engineer anyway. So why are we going to give you an extra seat? Well, and I, I understand what he's saying, sure. and I understand what you're saying. It's just. It's just it's unfortunate because you you know you we have no parking yeah we don't right we don't yeah I mean, it just shows who they are right well at the end of the day we're at a disadvantage and we've got to create incentive for them to want to 
by the county. So let's move on, and I'll show you some reasons why it's important we need to move on. And by the way, we need your help, and I'm going to tell you how you can help to create that big stick. Okay, so this is the representation. we got three, Lake County's got five, we're in seven. As you can see, we're clearly at a disadvantage. Okay? So when we walk into that room, we know right away it ain't going to go our way. So, here's some of what we faced um, in the last meeting, Friday. There were a whole bunch of resolutions that passed. Um, Ms. Lori and I could have voted no to every single one. That would have kind of stolen the thunder from the ones that we did vote on. And so, it gets a little bit like, really? Do I have to say no every single time? So we didn't. We voted or didn't vote. We Can everybody didn't. see that over there? And so these are the ones that I want to talk about today and why these were important. We voted no on every one of these. Our, there was a representative from Jagger County who voted yes to every one of these. And so I will, the values and principles thing is important. And I'll talk to you about this. So this is their regional plan. This is right out of their regional planning document. So we voted no to approve their regional plan. Let me just see if I can back up. So I'm going to be talking about the regional plan. They wanted to create a regional plan. They've been doing that for two years. They wrapped their regional plan around NEOSC, which everybody told me for the last two years, and actually two years before that, I was raising that up as an issue, and everybody says, oh, don't worry about it. It'll never go anywhere. It'll never have an impact on Geauga County. You don't need to worry. It's just money wasted. They wrapped their entire strategic plan around that NEOSC plan. And I have a little board deck that talks about NEOSC and who they are and where they come from. And so let's talk about their regional their regional plan and why, in the guts of their plan, you'll see why we objected and why we voted no. This is what they say. This strategic plan differs from other types of plans. The NOACA regional strategic plan is fundamentally not about transportation. They tell you that what they do is transportation, but what their strategic plan says, this is not about transportation planning. This is about something different. They are less concerned about the state of transportation and more concerned about demographic, economic trends, other things. They say it's about roads and bridges, but in their strategic plan, they're working on other things. Watch this hand. Watch this hand as a goosey with this hand. Also, take a look at this other line. It's also about compact, urban, are we an urban community in Jagger County? Compact, urban, sprawl, you know, sprawl, they consider us a sprawl. We've taken, we've sprawled and taken stuff away from them and they don't like that. This is just to demonstrate to you, again, this is right out of their strategic plan. Read this. This says, it's important to note that the development of this plan has been relied upon by the hard work of the 45 board members. We have three. The stakeholders, planning agencies, municipal public agencies. What do you not see in that list? Their strategic plan was based on all the bureaucracies. What's not included in the strategic plan is the voice of the, of the communities, the voice of the people that are paying their salaries. And you will hear that as a consistent theme through every single thing that they do. The NEAS plan, they tell you it's about grassroots, but you look at their board, and there is not one grassroots organization on their board. In fact, is their entire board was made up of an unelected bureaucrats. This is an example of some of what they base their decision process on. I could show you their entire 500 and some page final document. This comes out of their... Um, well, it's in their strategic plan now. It actually came through the NEOS plan. I'd love to show you the whole plan, but I just picked a couple of items out that I thought you might find interesting. Younger generations, in particular millennials, want to have walkable urban neighborhoods. Does that sound like Geauga County to you? Um, over suburbs, they prefer mass transit, bicycling, and walking to driving. I have kids. Not one of them. Once they started getting kids and driving to soccer practice, wanted to walk or ride their bikes. And especially today, not too many. Do you think that that's sound 
thought to base strategic plans on. That's a sim one simple example. I could show you hundreds of examples of the same kind of mindset. And I'm going to point one thing out to you. This came from an organization, their source, which they would not allow me to get up and talk about. And Kim knows that I challenged this in the meeting. I don't know if I have the idea for that or not. But um, they never allowed us to challenge their method, their data, the fundamental premise of their strategy. We begged them, we asked them, we pleaded for them, we tried every mechanism we could. I stood up in meetings and raised my hand and I raised a ruckus. Other people stood up and challenged them. They would never allow the public to have a voice. This is the voice they heard. That voice is from an organization called PIRG, which is a far left leaning uh, think tank. So that sentiment as they have it sourced, I actually took the source out of it, I should have included it. So you could go to their website and see for yourself who they are. So their sources for driving this decision, they like to manipulate the outcome. It was all steered, the outcome was predetermined, they just wanted to build the case for it. So people say to me, and they have said to me, you can't force Geauga County into this. This will have no impact on Geauga County. How many times have I heard that? How many times have we heard that, Jeff? This is right out of their plan, and it says NOACA will foster the success of communities. It's up to NOACA to foster our success. I'm just pointing that out to you. So you don't need to worry. Go home and sleep comfortable tonight because your success is well in their hands. Um, with regard to quality of life and economic strength, yada, 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 by creating a multimodal regional transportation plan for these organizations. We, I wasn't here at the time, the board, the board at that time, which included Mary Samiti, voted to opt out of this plan. We sent them a resolution, said we're not a part of this plan. We don't want to be a part of this plan, stay out of our county. They don't care. They included us in the plan. They don't reference the resolution. They don't reference the fact that we had hundreds of people going to various workshops and seminars and, and speaking out and saying, you know, we don't agree with this. They never referenced any input that was not in line with what they wanted to accomplish. This is their Sustainable Communities Organization, which is what Niaska is a part of. It was done through a four and a half, or three to four point two five million dollar grant from um, HUD. This is a, a, a segment right out of a HUD grant. So when um, NOACA and NIOSC submitted the grant application to HUD, this was the basis for the acceptance of the delivery of that money. Our regional planning effort will identify how to best deploy resources to address historic inequalities throughout our targeted community development. They say that historic patterns of distribution have not led to an equal distribution of community amenities. What they wanted to accomplish was an equal distribution of goods and services across the region. Who's the wealthiest county in northeastern Ohio? Who's not the wealthiest county in Jagger County? Who do you think wants the redistribution of the wealth? They said when they got the grant money and every one of those 44 board members voted to approve this in Noaka because they had not read it. I asked for a show of hands how many people read the grant application that was submitted for NIOS. This was before they knew who I was. Nobody raised their hand. I asked them how many people have read the law that governs NOACA. Not one person raised their hand with the exception of me and Grace. Blue When the NIOS study was completed, I asked them, we're going to approve this study. How many of you have read the study? Do you know how many people out of 44 read the study that they were about to approve? Yeah. Four. Are you seeing a pattern? Decisions being made without really understanding what those decisions are based on. This is the regionalism efforts. We are not the only target, by the way. This effort, funded by HUD, who has now created a, uh, an unholy allegiance or alliance with the Department of Transportation and EPA. That's called the uh, Sustainable Communities Organization. Okay, those three organizations have combined now to push regionalism 
which is an un unelected bureaucratic organization. You see the tyranny, and I'm going to use that term, tyranny, when the president of the board can dictate to us who our members are going to be on the board and what committees are going to sit on. What would you call that if we had no say over that? That ideology is being pushed off all across the country. This is their efforts to do regionalism across the United States. And by the way, this came right off of their website. So I'm showing you information. I didn't make this up. This came right out of the EPA website. Okay, this just talks a little bit more about NEOS. I'm trying to think about why we put that in there. That's the uh, vibrant NEO, the 2040 division, divisioning. That's what they spent the $4.25 million on. Oh, yeah, the great one. All the workshops we were going to. Uh, to create a socially, that's right. Remember the grant application? They're all about social equity. This has nothing to do with transportation. Do you see any place in here transportation, road dollars, potholes, bridges, which is what they will tell you they're there to do, to take care of our infrastructure. How many times have you heard, oh, we're here to take care of infrastructure? I don't know where social equity comes into infrastructure, but maybe you see something that I don't. And so if you take a look at, I'm not going to dwell on this slide, those three organizations, sustainable communities, offer the grant dollars to the four primary MPOs in Northeastern Ohio. It's not just one MPO. NOACA is one of four that combine. And so this is a regional plan that takes care of all of Northeastern Ohio. This is a federal effort to push that ideology across northeastern Ohio. So all of these counties, Asheville included, Trumbull Portage, they're all going to be impacted by this plan. And it is the same plan. And yet they will say, we're creating a regional plan or an effort that's based on grassroots. It's based on what the people want. Will you ask your opinion? Go ahead, Elsie. Can I, can I just say in, in regards to that, um, this um, plain dealer has been touting the east uh, side greenway project, which is to make bike paths from Cleveland all the way through uh, High Hawk to, to, to the reach the east side to Base Mills and Pepper Pike and that. And so I went on their website because they said to put input into it. They don't want my input. All they wanted to know is, do I like to walk? How far do I want this plan to go? They just are assuming that everybody wants this. And we don't want it, but they don't give you the opportunity to say you don't want it. I did finally write them a letter saying how I am uh, upset that NOACA is spending this money, $118,000, just to fund the study. That came out of transportation funds that should be going to roads and bridges in um, well, our county and Cuyahoga County, and it's not. It's going to a bike path, which I'm sure people in Pepper Pike, and, and I used to live on Gates Mills Boulevard, I don't think I would like to have a bike path in front of my house. One, what, 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 one comment relative to that, and that is, NOACA's overhead to manage, they manage about $35 million, it fluctuates with stimulus dollars, 35 to $45 million, um, is about 20%. It costs us 20% to manage $35 million. I think that's a little bit exorbitant. I've, I've actually asked our staff to put together a profile on all the NPOs in the state of Ohio. What is NOACA's overhead so, you know, compared to everybody else's? I'm seeing 10%, 5%. So that information is going to be coming to the surface. This came right out of the NEOS slides. I want you to see this is order of magnitude. So when you're looking at decisions that are being made, they're going to make policy, they're going to set direction, they're going to set strategy based on the data they collected. They collected no data from Geauga County. 223 people in this particular workshop, four from Wayne, nine from Geauga, I don't know what that is, from Ashtabula. But you see that uh, order of magnitude, who is driving the decision process? Who do you think is setting the direction for the region? Is it Geauga County? Is it one of these other smaller communities? It is not. And that's the purpose of that slide. So here's some sample 
recommendations that came out, pro promote infill and establish cities, develop a robust uh, network of uh, regional centers connected by multimodal corridors, yada, yada, yada. Here's some more. Uh, make white walking bike paths transit better, more accessible. Okay? They have a term called location efficiencies. Their concept is if you can centralize people around industry, then they won't have to drive a car. You will hear consistently at the NOACA meetings and any meetings that NOACA establishes that we don't want to drive cars, that the young people want to walk, that they want to ride bicycles. They're not asking us, they're telling us. They, they continue, this is a psychological ploy, to continue, if you hear it enough and enough and enough, very soon you're going to file away and say, well, yeah, I really do want to ride a bike when it's 30 degrees outside the snow. So, more uh, sample. All right, I'm not going to go there because we're running out of time. That's NEOSC on the front of the NOACA website. Here's something that you're going to find interesting. This is a slide that comes right out of their plan, and I don't know if the colors are very good, but notice Geauga County, right here, is a part of this. You can't read the legend. Can you read the legend? No. This yellow area over here is called the second ring suburb to Cleveland. They do not refer to us as Geauga County. They refer to us as a suburb of Cleveland. In any language you hear at the Noaka board, we are considered part of greater Cleveland. We are. Most people in Geauga County probably work in Geauga County. They probably do, but I live in Geauga County. I'm not part of greater Cleveland. Your economic benefit drives from that county. My economic... Your, what, most people's livelihoods derive from the economic health of Cuyahoga County. Really? I think so. If you're, if you're working with Geauga County. I don't know. I, I don't work if in Geauga County. 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 If you close Cuyahoga County, the, you know, the big paying jobs on the west end of this county, with the bad Okay, but I'm not a suburb. I'm not a political suburb to Cuyahoga County. The decisions that I want made in this county, I don't go to Cuyahoga County to ask them to, to establish the policies and the procedures and so on and so forth. What they're trying to establish is that we have a political connection, that they're more important, that they can drive our decisions. That's they not the way they want to be in the state of Ohio. That's not the way we're established on a constitutional basis. And I raised my hand to defend the Constitution of Ohio and in, in the United States. I didn't say that that Constitution you know, did away with that border. Nobody, I, I agree with you completely. I took the same one. Skip? Um, I pay my taxes here in Geauga County. I don't pay them in Cuyahoga. Well, if you work in Cuyahoga, you're paying the income tax there. Well, and they keep it in that county, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But to, to transfer our tax dollars out of Geauga County into Cuyahoga County, if I don't work there, is, is not a good... I mean, I understand what you're saying. I understand what your perspective is. I don't agree with that perspective. I'm not part of Greater Cleveland. I'm in Geauga County. Is it most of the transfer of funds going to D.C. and not to another entity that's coming back to the federal government? Well, it, there's that's a that's a good conversation to have. Um, I don't well, know. No, but I mean, you're talking about transfer of money. Mm -hmm. So the, the transfer of money is across the nation, actually. I mean, right. you, you look at it going to. Washington, Washington then spreads that those funds out across the country, but we get a big chunk of it back for our area. That money goes, in the case of this situation, goes to Cleveland for them to decide where they put it. But I think what it is, if, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, I think what Nancy is seeing is, is we probably give more that the federal government actually has their paws on than we actually give back completely. Is that what you're saying? Right. 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 Yeah. We are. Okay, so, again, point being, they're trying to make decisions for us in terms of how we're, we live, what our culture is, how we use our tax dollars, so on and so on and so forth. That's their plan. They have a plan for Geauga County, and this is part of their plan. So if you take a look at... And this talks about, well, you can't see the legend. I can't read the legend there. <laughs> if you take a look at their, um, where their strategic investment areas are, so the orange up there in the top left-hand side is strategic investment area, you can see that as part of the red. Their plan is to put money into those red areas. They want to create connecting corridors around Geauga County. This is 
rail systems here. These green corridors here are wildlife corridors and bike paths and connected um, metro, parks. metro parks and all that kind of stuff. And so they have a plan. If I showed you more of their slides, their plan is to increase our parks triple beyond what they are today. Well, who pays for that? It comes off our tax rolls. Somebody's got to pay the burden on that. And is that what we've signed up for, is to let somebody from Cleveland in that community make decisions for our county in terms of how that all is uh, changes? Go ahead, Tim. Well, just the other point of that, too, is if you triple the amount of parks, what happens to the people who are currently living in those areas, you know, on that land that they want to try to turn Well, there's a lot of intended consequences in there. What you don't see, and I'm not even getting into this, I could spend an hour on this slide alone, but what you see, what you don't see in here that's in here is the West Reserve Land Conservancy, the various conservancies that are involved, because that's protected property, so they get to dictate how that property is used and so forth. There is a plan, and part of their plan is to change through zoning, through uh, riparian uh, setbacks and so on and so forth, through conservancies, and on and on and on, what the nature and the culture of Jerry County is. Now, I object to that. I don't, maybe you agree with that. I don't know. I don't want them changing our culture, changing who we are, and making us a subclass citizen to Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Here is another element that not made. That was the vote tally. Do you want to show people for what? Yeah, I, I talked about that. I don't know what we need to go on. Um, I just want to make a quick point on this slide. We elect elected officials to make decisions on this kind of thing. We elect state house representatives, state senators, county commissioners. None of those individuals are comprehended within the NOACA structure. In fact, is the NOACA structure undermines, they're making decisions on how to transform, so to speak, our county. And our elected officials, and including us, and township trustees, and so on and so forth, are taken out of that equation. Unelected bureaucrats that we have no control over are making decisions about cost sharing and, and sharing tax dollars and that kind of stuff. If there was audio on that last slide, do you want to play the audio too, too bad? Sorry. Okay. Um, what was the slide? Before? What's that, that right there? There's audio there. That, that was a, a, the voting pattern on those resolutions. How do you know that? Because we were there and we have the voting record. We asked for the voting record. They don't. They just told me they don't have a voting record. They don't we keep were, one. Like we were there. We have, I they have voting tallies. You can ask them for the voting tally. And I, that, I just did. No, they they said they, yes. yes. They do roll call vote. They do a roll call vote, and they don't record it. They record who voted no. And anybody who didn't vote no voted yes. I asked them that. Their, yeah. I asked them that as late as yesterday. Like, I have the three and a half hours of audio from, from the meeting, so if you'd like to listen to it, I'll well, I, I, I don't doubt, I mean, you could hear I things. Know. I asked him, do you keep a tally of the vote? Yes, and they will release it when they give the meeting minutes from this, which is right before the next um, work. I'll be interested because I was told that they did not. They do, they just haven't released it yet. It'll be in the meeting. Oh, I know that they record it because when we say no, they say, okay, who was it that voted no if they didn't hear us? So they certainly keep track of the no and the abstain votes, and they, they make the record. I would have thought that. I asked the question, and I'm telling you, I didn't make it up. No, yeah, I'll, I'll call them and ask them myself. But well, I, I did I, ask. I asked Amy, uh, Amy Stacy, and she said it would be in the meeting minutes, and I asked her when will those come out, and mm -hmm. she said it would be before the next meeting. But I will tell you that I did What is this particular? Uh... Put the microphone by the.
Sorry, guys. It's important to hear things that are said and the way you can Mr. Ryder, what were you talking about, roll call vote? What, is, what did you mean? No, they called the name of each person and how, okay, I see. how they voted. Yeah, I see. You know, like you I guys do, a voice right like I do in the Board of Elections. I mean, we call right. the names of people. When you're in the legislature, you, right. vote, you vote on a board and, you know, they put their name down and how you right, vote. Right. Right. Now, my understanding has always been it's just a, a voice vote. It's a voice vote. It is, but if you, if you say no, they actually record your name. Or if you say it's So for all these various things that were passed, we, we'd be able to see minutes and we see the people who voted no and all those things? That's right. I didn't know if they recorded that. Well, they recorded every meeting, and they they make a point. If you vote no, they say who voted no. So you know, it would be great if we had little buttons we could push, I suppose. And if you were to go back and ask them, like I've asked them for past tallies, you know, 10 years ago, what was the tally, like the, the HUD grant? I asked for that a while back, right. and I said, okay, who voted for this, who, who opposed it? And so they were able to show me the tally of everybody that voted for it and who voted against it. And so the tally was 44 to 0. So anyway, the reason for this slide is I wanted to show you, this comment came out of the last page in the NOACA strategy document. Notice what it says. We have a real... Goal and strategy for transforming Northeastern Ohio. I'm not sure that I want my transportation planning organization to be in charge of transforming Northeastern Ohio. I want to know that they're working to make sure that the potholes are filled, that our bridges don't fall down, that our highways are taken care of. I'm not sure I'm in I'm, I'm in favor of them transforming Ohio. That's why I have saw Sarah Lachered and John Eklund and Dave Joyce. I hold them responsible for where we're going. That's just me. Maybe we think differently. Okay. We voted. Um, we voted against the safety. Here's just another item that we voted no against. We talked about regionalism. We spent an enormous amount of time on it. This is just another example of something that was in that meeting that we voted no to. We were the only two no votes, and it was the safety and operations council. Not that we're against safety. I made a point. We have the audio for it that. We have a great sheriff in our county. We have a great county engineer. We have a great Department of Disaster. We do a pretty good job of keeping people safe. I'm not sure we need another bureaucracy with that provides oversight on our agencies. They passed it, so we're going to have a little oversight on our agencies. TLCI. I don't know how many of you know too much about total livable communities. That's what this is. And they're actually doing that in Lake County as well. It's a very similar plan. Okay. I'm, I'm going to show you the bottom line to total livable communities. But first of all, I'll read it off of here because you can't read it off. The TLCI programs provide federal funding assistance to communities and agencies to, com to complete plans that improve livability. And I think that's all we want to say about that. Um, that and bottom box that you can't read there is probably... one cited that it had a little footnote marker and it said that the definition of livability can be found at this website. So that's what this is. Okay. So this is the Department of Transportation website. This is their definition for livability. And we know what this current administration is all about, so this will not be a surprise to you. Livability means being able to take your kids to school, to work, see a doctor, drop by the grocery or post office, go out to dinner and a movie... Play with your kids at the park, all without having to get in your car. <laughs> and you're seeing a consistent theme here. They don't want you walk, riding in a car. Skip, is it, can I ask you a question? Sure, go ahead. I, I mean, this has been going on for forever. Is this something new that you finally discovered that these people want you know, to have these communities for the environment because you don't drive cars and... We put all that stuff together, and we know where these people have been coming at us for 25 or 35 years. I mean, you know, I'm 66 years old, as long as I can remember back and been looking at the political scene, that's kind of where we've been going. It seems to escalate every year, but we, you know, we've got this environmental situation being what it is, and 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a good point, and here's my response to that. No, I, I just haven't heard anything new. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for this, okay, and look at what these guys are doing. Well, of course, this, this has been happening for a long time. This board is controlled by Cuyahoga County, and we can see that from the numbers and the population, so we know where those people are. All true. Everything you say is true. They're called progressives for a reason. And by the way, Grace made the point no less than six times in that meeting that this was a great progressive plan and they're going to move it forward. The difference is twofold for me. First of all, it is time for us to start pushing back on this stuff because they are moving along and they're going to change our future unless we stop it. If you're willing to roll over and let them do it, that's fine. I am not. And so I've been not rolling over the, the, the difference. 40 years. The, the I'm difference. Just wondering if there's something new here, and I just don't see anything new. Well, the, the new is, Nowaka has not has not been as deeply involved with it as it is today. Well, they have programs now. They have uh, federal organizations behind them they didn't have before. They have funding behind them they didn't have before. They're amping it up, and so this is a wake up call to say, look, this is happening. But that's and because you, the, the whole federal government. Is no, 20 I'm, years I'm, ago, the federal government didn't spend anything near what they spend on these kind of things. Now. I'm not going to disagree with any of that. You, you understand. You and I yeah, understand. No, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, there's no, you're right. There's nothing new here, maybe to you and I, but to some other people in the room that may be new, maybe they yeah. want to get involved and yeah. be, a, be a part of pushing back on this stuff. So go ahead. I appreciate your bringing it to the forefront because most of us have been in the living and we live our lives and we're not paying attention to this. I appreciate that you okay. know it's all about it, but I just, this is just coming to the forefront for me. Yes, we've seen changes taking place in our lives, okay, as we go on in our years, and we see the changes, and they're very subtle, but we don't, look, we don't know that this is happening in the background. And now we see it. He's bringing it forward for us, and I appreciate it. I understand. That's what's new. The people are waking up. I mean, the ultimate question is, how do we get out of this mm -hmm. club that we are forced to be in? Here is, here is well, I'm going to answer the question, and I know we're running you know, short on time, so I'll, I'll flip through this real quick. Um, here's a legislative, here is a, uh, they have a leg legislative agenda, which I brought a copy of tonight. On that legislative agenda, one of the items wants to change our constitu Ohio Constitution to permit them to change how our Ohio gas tax dollars are spent. So today, our Ohio gas tax dollars are required by the Constitution to go to roads. They don't like that because they can't dip their fingers into that pot. And so they passed a resolution to lobby for the ability to be able to um, siphon off dollars out of that pool into mass transit, bicycle trails, a whole bunch of other stuff. If they're permitted to do that, and then they dilute, which is what they're doing on the federal side, because we're putting up miles and miles of soundproofing walls and bike trails and all kinds of other stuff. And by the way, I have no issue with bike trails. I just don't, I want that soul on its own merit. And as, as you, if we could hear the audio, you would hear me tell them that. Look. We made a promise to people. When we created the constitutional amendment, they wanted to ensure that, that money is going to go to roads. If we work against them to break that promise, that's wrong. That's fundamentally wrong. If you want to sell a bicycle trail, great. Take that case to the public, sell it, and if they buy it, then we'll put in bicycle trails. If not, stop siphoning dollars away from our roads to put into something that we, we're breaking a promise on. <coughs> and so that's a wake-up. That's an awareness thing for you. I don't know if you knew that that was coming or not. And so we have an opportunity. So what do you do? You now have this awareness. You can get a hold of Sarah Lazarette. I've got a meeting set up with Sarah here in a week or so with John Eklund down in Columbus with ODOT. And we're going to be having a conversation about what's happening. Is there a way at the Ohio level to change this? Because uh, MPOs are organized under the state of Ohio. They're required by federal uh, law. But we can organize them and manage them in any way we choose. Excuse me, have you talked to other people from other MPOs that are in similar situations that, yeah, that's like Geauga cool. County? I mean, down in Cincinnati now, Cincinnati must have the same kind of thing. Columbus must have the same kind of situation where they have rural counties that are in um, these MPOs that are dominated by a big... Out of the 88 counties yeah. in the state of Ohio, only 33 are MPOs. 
then it was just reduced by one more because Wayne County just left their MPO because they don't like the strings that were attached. Columbia County, who could be in an MPO, they've got two surrounding them, has chosen not to, and I talked to both of them. We have to get back together and talk about the ins and outs. Wayne County tells me they didn't lose any money, that they're doing fine in the process, so i got to find out how that works for them. And so, uh, yes, I mean, in Cincinnati, that's actually a cross-state MPO, so that one actually crosses the border. They're a regional, multi-state kind of a thing. And so with my experience with most people on these MPOs, as within many bureaucratic organizations, is they really don't read the bills. They go to these meetings, they listen to all this stuff, they rubber stamp the answers because they're just going there to go through the process. They're asleep at the switch from my perspective. And I hate to say it that way because it sounds like a criticism. I'm frustrated with people who do not step up and take responsibility for ensuring that the citizens are being looked out for. And many, many, many bureaucrats don't do that. I mean, when I go to the NOACA meetings and I speak up, many of those people sitting around the table. And, and I will tell you, I go to the coffee room and I go into the men's room and I get people following me there and say, keep it up, you're asking good questions. And I have to turn around and say to them, why are you not at the table? So, anyway. So, to close the wrap this up. Just to make a point, the M MPOs, NOACA is a reality for us. I can't ignore that. We're not going to leave NOACA. We get $2 million a year coming back through NOACA to our roads. I'm not going to interfere with Joe Cattell's ability to get the money necessary, nor would it be proper to do that. And so we need to focus on that reality and how we can change that equation. I don't know the right answer, but I do know this. I can't do it, but we can do it. If we can inform enough people about what we're up against and we get a hold of our state representatives and our federal representatives, there is now an effort to lobby. In fact, as NOACA wants to hire two lobbyists, one to lobby at the state level, your tax dollars are going to pay for that, and one to lobby at the federal level to raise your taxes. They want to raise the federal gas tax by 15 cents a gallon. They want to raise the state tax by X amount. I don't even know what it is. It's actually fees involved, too. Plus, they want to change the Constitution. The only way for us to thwart their lobbying efforts, because they're very powerful, they have a lot of money, is for you to speak up, for people to speak up, get a hold of their representatives, and say, no, no, there is so much waste in the system. You know how much it costs for a mile of soundproofing wall? A million dollars a mile. They've been driven down 71 lately. <laughs> they're putting soundproofing walls along farm fields. Does this make sense to anybody? My goodness. Okay, right now we're at the mercy of NOACA. That could change if you reached out to your state representatives and said, come on, guys, let's have a little fairness going on here. And, um, by the way, if we left NOACA, now there was some bantering about, you know, they had four options they put on the table for Geauga County to leave NOACA. We never asked for that. In fact, as in Friday's meeting, I challenged them because that's one of the three lies they told on Friday. That lie was that we asked to get into NOACA so they developed the four options. And so I asked them for evidence. They said, if you have any evidence that we asked for that, I want to see it. Because we didn't ask for that. Well, there was people talking. Okay, there was spitballing, there was people talking, what if, what if, but nobody asked you to do that. And so, leaving the NOACA, let's say hypothetically we did, and there are some ways that we could, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be involved with our lives. That's just the reality. They have responsibility for air quality, water quality in Geauga County because they have a regional authority over that, which gives them an entree into our county to do other things. We just have to filter that in or factor that into what we do and how we come up with a strategy. Um, I don't know whether I mentioned this going into this whole thing or not. This is not going to be easy. I never said this is going to be easy to get all the answers. I don't, and I don't. Skip, when you... Your figures up there, you say Judd County contributes $10 million in gas tax and federal, federal gas tax. Where does that come from? Okay, here's how that calculation is done. If you talk to Joe Cattell, he'll tell you we have 95,000 cars, registered cars in Geauga County. Okay? Now, this is all estimates. 95,000? 95,000. I, I, I take exception with that. He told me we have 95,000 registrations which could be a boat a trailer, a house trailer, a motorhome. It's not necessarily okay. cars that are burning fuel every day, according to what he told me. Okay. That's all. All right. Well, what I mean, I'm telling you how the calculation was done, and then you can get 
the, the I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, but finish your. All right. So this is how I did the calculation. Right or wrong? You can go get different facts. Yeah. Joe told me ninety-five thousand cars. I asked him ninety-five thousand registered cars. So if I've got ninety-five thousand cars and I go to the AAA website, they say the average car uses fifteen thousand mi- or drives fifteen thousand miles a year, and the average mile per gallon is twenty-five miles per the gallon. It's simple math. So you calculate how many miles per year the average car is going to drive, how much gas it's going to consume at the average of 25 miles to the gallon, and then you multiply that times 15 cents for the federal government, or 18 cents, sorry, 18.5 cents for the federal government and 28 cents for the state of Ohio. In the state of Ohio, if you go to uh, tax.gov, they have a sheet, and I've got a copy, anybody's one, and I'll email it to you, that shows you exactly what is given back out of that 28 cents a gallon to each county, township, city. It is by statute, by constitution, a formula that's required, and it's very clear. It's, it's really cool. The interesting thing about that spreadsheet, by the way, is that 75% is siphoned right off the top to the Department of Transportation first. So we contribute 28 cents on a gallon, and 75% of whatever the dollar amount is immediately gets to be given to ODOT. And we get the rest. And so each county in the state of Ohio is given $4 million. Each county, that makes no difference what your population is, the formula says $4 million to every county. And then there's other calculations that are done for cities and townships and everything. Um, so every county gets $4 million. Every county. Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga County gets the same $4 million that we get. That's just the state. Yeah. And that's just the state. Yeah. That's the state tax. Okay? And so the interesting thing about that is ODOT siphons off 75%. Immediately, off that total dollar amount, if my calculation was correct, and that's what did I say it was, 16 million or something going to the state. Okay, so they say been off 75 percent. In Geauga County, we have a thousand miles of roads, approximately. Joe Cattell takes care of 800 of those. So ODOT uses 75 percent of our gas tax dollars to take care of 200 miles of roads, and we have levies and other things set up to take care of the other 800 miles of roads. And so I asked ODOT the question, why didn't you give us the 75%? We'll take care of our own roads. This was after talking to Joe. And um, and then you can stay out of our county. How would that work for you? And they said, well, you can't do that. And I talked to Joe, confirmed it. How many people do we need? Could we take care of those other 200? You're already taking care of 800. Could you take care of 1,000? Absolutely. Not a problem. I can hire 10 people, and I can give ODOT, I mean, I can give the taxpayer back a lot of money. And so the interesting question, and part of what I'm going to be talking to ODAP here shortly, is where did that money go? How is that used? Is it, you know, is it being spread around the state of Ohio? It's just an intriguing question to me. What are you using the 75% for, not just in Junk County, but across the state of Ohio? It just seems like an awful lot of money to me. So anyway, that's the presentation on NOACA. As you can see, there's a lot more to NOACA than just roads and bridges. And they have a plan. They're executing the plan, which is new. That's, they've got a new level of interest in, in transforming northeastern Ohio, and they're pushing that forward. I, for one, am going to resist that to the extent that I can. And the new trans- the, these transportation bills that the federal government votes on every couple of years, um, they keep giving the MPOs more and more authority. So the next one that comes out may end up getting, and, and I say may because the, the draft that was presented um, has this in there that so if it's passed, it gives them some authority over housing then too. Right now they don't have authority over housing. And that would be the time. So every couple of years more power is given to the shows. Well the WAC over the years and to your point Ed, the WAC over the years has consistently, progressively increased the scope and the power of the organization. And so where does it stop? You can at some point you can say stop guys. Really? Yeah. Progressive. Well, I mean, it's your, it's your representatives and your senators who pass the transportation bills that contain more, contain more power for these, for these NPOs. So you've been around longer than anybody else in the room. I know. can tell. And so, you know, you got to have some answers here. you got to help us out here a little bit. You've got these years and years of experience in the political system and everything. You've got our connections down in Ohio. Like help us to solve it. Rolling down there. So, anyway, well, that's it. Any questions? I know it's late, and I know we've spent a lot of time here. Today, so. I, just, I just have one question. Okay. Going back to the alternates, um, and it was asked um, of Mr. Uh, Spitaleri about how many meetings he attends, 
on the WAC meetings. I just would like to ask Mr. Gear how many new WAC meetings he attended. I went to one. Okay. For and Joe Cattell was supposed to go to the others. He went to three, and uh, his deputies went so, to others. So I would imagine that that continues. That Mrs. Smith will be going to most of the meetings. She went to the one last Friday. I'm going to all the ones in February. Well, I, I just have a letter that I want to give. I won't take the time to read it here, but it's a letter to all the commissioners, and I, too, ask um, my state my disapproval of Mrs. Speed's reinstatement. Didn't you send that to us already? This is another one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hey, just, how many meetings do they get? Well, they're quarterly now. They used to be once a month, now they're quarterly. And just so everybody knows, each of the commissioners has the authority to pick their own office. We don't interfere with one another. Right. So, but it's only four times a year. Now. Well, for the, the board meeting, the board meeting. Yeah. But then there's all there's, no, no, for the board there's meeting. There's policy meetings and yeah, planning yeah, yeah, meetings no, know. and you know subcommittee and all these subcommittee meetings and so so. So, did you find this informative? Was this a complete waste yeah. of time? Did you? So, yeah. it's a different kind of a commission meeting. But. Absolutely not. You think that we're transparent here? We're going to be like Noaka. You can find it. It's 15 levels down in the website. On the 16th page. So, but thank you for that suggestion. I guess the only question I have is, is, is there anybody that, that, you know, at the end of the day, we work for the, for the, for the people of this county. Is there anybody here that disagrees with this? What we're talking about. I mean, no, I think as long as we can keep getting our money back for our county, I, mean, I don't want to do anything here that's not going to bring our. I mean, we're getting so little of our federal dollars back, anyways. I don't want to cut our. I don't think there's anybody here to spite our face. Right. Yeah, I don't think we disagree. I would be screaming against these people if I were down there just as everybody else is because this is a waste. I view it as a waste of money and, and time and. It, it, and the, the, the thing is, like I, I went down to the one meeting, and it, and it, and it, and it's, it's hard to, you know, it's hard to sit there and, and you know, they put these big presentations. The day that I was down there, you know, they were talking about, you know, they brought in, they bring in like a lot of these people that are good people for what, for what they're trying to, 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 to talk about, and 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 they're very mission specific in what they could do, but like. They had they had put on somebody with like alternative transportation measures with that day that they had this bike trail that they were tra talking about that was going to go across like Interstate 90 and they put these bridges up like these glass bridges and I mean they, this this presentation was like this is crazy. Meantime, I mean you drive through the streets of Cleveland to get to the Noaka meeting. You need to put a mouthpiece in your mouth so you don't chip your teeth because the roads are that bad. And, that, and that's my, my biggest contention. It was like, you know, and Nancy, I'll, 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 I'll tell you point blank. Like, the whole issue with the Chardon bike trail, from when I came on board a little over two years ago, you know, we had, and still to this day, you know, you look at that, the, the Newcomb Road, you know, where they have a ton of, of accidents because of, the condition of that road. It's in Middlefield Township, but it's a lot of issues where that road is in really, really bad shape. The Amish go down there with their buggies, and they're basically just like rolling over. I, I, I mean, I deal with these people every day. I hear the complaints. They basically think it's a county road. We don't have the authority under it. It's a township road, but I asked, I asked, I asked, I asked, and it's never never available. You can't do that. It's the township. They got to worry about that themselves. They got to worry about that themselves. Well, at the end of the day, you know, what is the value of a life, of either a life, somebody losing a limb, somebody, you know, I personally had a good a good friendship with the family there that, that on, on their way to church on a Sunday, rolled over, they rolled their buggy over on that. They hit that soft area. And, and they ended up actually having the baby fall out. Thank God, you know, the baby made it through, but the part of that steel buggy came down on that child. But it's like, that was my frustration. It's like, we have areas that need some, some support. We don't have the money. To the, you know, Middlefield Township, it's not, 
their fault in the sense that they don't have necessarily the money because that's what they have to work with. But like, let's pull it. Let's focus on priorities, and it's just like in Cleveland. Let's focus on getting some of these roads repaired and and, and doing stuff that is putting our public at risk tremendously all the time, and we're worried about this stuff. That's great if we have the money to do that, and and we we have all this fixed. Let's focus on that. Let's try to set a level of priorities, and that was like totally... Gibberish to to them, you know. It's it's hard. It's 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 well, tough. Maybe we get some of that excess park money and fix it. I, <laughs> I went to there the meeting. Go. I went to. I had. I couldn't get into the parking lot. I can think of a couple of meetings. We don't treat the same guys. I couldn't get into the parking lot. I don't want to go around the corner. The corner. <laughs> the the it's crazy. Bus right through the road. Commissioner Miller. Yeah. If you had dipped your vote against the bike path that succeeded in Noaga, would that money have gone to uh, something other than another bike path? You know, and that's the whole thing. They're, they, they have that money earmarked well, for that. that. Totally. So you, you should know? be working on a higher level. And, and I understand that, but not, not not screwing over the people of Chardon. But but it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't doing anything to the people of Chardon. It was the it was the position that I was taking. If if we would have had a, 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 a complete agreement across the board or a majority of that agreement, it would have sent the message to say, yes, we understand. And I basically told them point blank. You know, I gave it to them just like I gave it to you. And and if there's some level of pushback, that's what changes policy. But if we just continue to rubber stamp it and just say, it's earmarked and that's what we're going to do it for, then here's we're right back to square one. So I understand what you're saying, but it's just it's a and, and I and I true truly wholeheartedly understand. But it's it's just like Skip said. I mean, they, there's the op the options now have been is is, is that this certain num- number of percentage is going to be put into these types of programs, and I get it. But it's like at the end of the day, the policy is what's failing because there's priorities that that money should be given to. You know, it's like let's you know you broke your you broke your toe, but they're putting a cast on your right arm. It's not fixing the problem. I'm an engineer. I completely agree with putting money into roads and bridges. The, the infrastructure in this country is in terrible condition. But these actions need to take place at a level above the locality. They need to take place at, at the federal state level. level. Federal Absolutely. Level. But who changes federal level? We do. You know, we we have our representatives. Right, but I'm saying this is that we we have if if we could all work together to do this and to get that message out like that day there, I couldn't even get a second in that in that room. But to Mr. Blackley's point, refusing that money would not have helped the roads in Middlefield or anywhere else. It would not have taken any money away from those projects. That's not true, though. And, and, and just to be clear on that, there's uh, monies that are set aside, and I disagree with this. Particularly, but uh, at the federal level, it's for alternative forms of transportation. That's the money that goes into bike trails, alternative forms of transportation. They can also be used for buggy trails, and you can alter a road to make it safer for buggy trails, and those monies are come out of the same pot. And so that money coming out of that pot for bicycle trails is taken away from the buggy trails or the buggy paths. So we can make we can have a discussion about the true no buggy in, trail uh, project in competition with it at that time. No, 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 I, no, I understand, understand that. that. I understand right. that. So the project right. has to be submitted, and there's right. a process for that. But, and so I don't know if that happened or right. not. But it's not to say that it wouldn't have been considered. Right. Part, part, part of the challenge, right. part of the part of the challenge we've had up until this point, <laughs> part of the challenge we've had up until this point is the lack of awareness. Because as you go to the NOACA boards, by the by the way, they're making most of these decisions in Cleveland. So we've got to get people at the table who have an awareness of the pots of dollars and where those monies can be spent. And so Middlefield will be submitting some buggy trail. Now we've made them aware. They've increased their awareness, so they have the opportunity to do that. That was never done before. And that's so we're bringing new awareness. Grace Galucci's credit. I mean, when she was here, actually, we had her here for a presentation. Mm-hmm. She actually was the one that actually brought that up. You know that that because she. Obviously, felt the pressure of, you know, the concern, and 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 that's when all of a sudden they said that there is, those dollars could be utilized for. It. That's huge for Geauga when you look at all the Amish that we do have in this county, and not only that, it's not even for their safety, 
But it's for your safety also when you're driving down the street. I mean, 528 is, is beautiful when you know that there is a safe area that they're able to, to be on and you're able to be on. Can the crash occur? Absolutely. But your percentages have gone down so much more when there's a designated trail like that, or a, not a trail, but a designated area that they're able to ride in. And it just makes sense. And it's like, you know, I, I just, I think that, you know, and the other thing too is, is I, I think we all like rustic Geauga County, or we would be living in Cleveland Heights right now. You know, but right. at the end of the day, if we can put those measures in place and 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 keep a population like the Amish in this county, it's going to allow us to have years to come of what we all love for this county here because. They're going to stay, and I talk to them every day. They leave, they leave, they leave because we're got. I mean, it's it just keeps growing and growing, and we're never going to stall. We're never going to stop growth, but if we can do some of those things to give them a feeling of security when they're on the roads, being able to keep their their traditions and, and what they believe in, it only is going to help our county that much more too. And I I just you know, and I guess at the end of this, what I can also say is that. I, I, I think that it's important for everybody to understand because I can sense that there's a lot of tension between these appointments. And I understand the concerns. But at the end of the day, it's it's no different than this. If if cooler heads prevail and, and we really just take a couple steps back and look at the whole thing, is look at the passion that you have with Skip. Look at the passion that you have with Kim. I, you know, I think... I, I, in all respects to Blake, I don't necessarily like the idea of Mary being on that board, but at the same time, I also understand her passion. You know, so at the end of the day, I think we need to just look at the whole ball of wax and say we've got great people that are willing to do whatever to support us. We just need to get behind these people because. At the end of the day, I think we all have the best interest in our heart and in, in our in our actions to want to keep what we have here and bring back to whatever we can do for Geauga County. But it's just, I, I just got, I, I just want to say, we've got to just have a, re, we got to hit the reset button and we got to restart this to be able to just everybody's just got to got to settle down and 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 I and I and I think that. We need to give people an opportunity. If they fail, we need to hear you. If they're doing their job, we need to hear you. But at the end of the day, we're trying our best to be able to bring these people together. And they're all good people. We're all good people here that want the best for, for our families and for, fu- for the future of this county. But we, we, we can't fight one another here. we got to stop this because we're not going to succeed by, by, by slashing each other down. We got to stick to what we want and what we love here, and we love Geauga County, and that's what's going to be important for us to go to. And and I just think that everybody's got to just you know this this heat's got to settle down. You got to allow us to be able to try try things, to do our job. We've got Skip as a new commissioner. I'm a new commissioner. I've only been here two years. Blake's been here one year. We've got. We've got a team that we that wants to work for you guys, and and you just gotta let us try to go through this phase. I don't like to come into here and, and have to deal with the controversy, and and the, the 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 you know all the all the you know rhetoric of you know opening up my emails and there's thirty letters of of of, of you know you know just disrespect. It's like we gotta respect one another. We gotta just hit that reset button. And, and and I think we just need to move forward, and, and I, I think you just got to give us a chance. I think there's a song like that. Um, one, one other uh, point I want to make, you're going to hear an argument being made to raise our gas tax at the federal level that our infrastructure is falling apart. Let me leave you with this point, because I've been talking to a lot of people about this, and it sounds like you've got an engineer, I don't know if you're a really engineer, civil engineer. Really yes, if you talk to Joe Cattell, what he will tell you, and I encourage you to call him, he's a great guy, bug him, because he's not working hard enough. And, um, right, Linda? Um, he will tell you, let's solve the problem first locally, second at the state level, and lastly at the federal level. Um, I have yet, to, and I've asked a question, I have yet to have Nowaka respond to this question. 
where do we have the problem? If we need to take care of you, you say we've got a problem, you say we've got a shortfall, where is the shortfall? Show me the problem, and then let's find the solution to the fix that problem. Is the problem Cleveland? Because I would say we don't need sound ripping walls and bike trails, you need to fill potholes first. It's a priority issue. And if you need to take care of Cleveland, then maybe we need to take a look at taxes, and maybe Geauga County is willing to throw in and help you with that a little bit. And we'll have to go to the people and talk to them about that. But let's not impose a big federal tax, which will never go away. And they'll always break the promises. And if you looked at the Grow America, it's on the Department of Transportation website. Go out there and look for Grow America. Look inside of that bill. It's only 500 pages. It's fun reading. <laughs> um, and you will see all kinds of programs, not transportation. So they want to take increase your tax, gas tax dollars, is what they like to do, and then embed inside of that all kinds of pork. That's why we don't want to increase the federal tax. Let's focus on the local taxes. We can get Sarah and John and clutch them at the throat and make sure that they do the right things. And so with that said, I, I appreciate everybody coming. Like Ralph said, we appreciate the questions. Go ahead. You can be as hard on us as you want. Beat up on us. As Ralph said, we're, doing, we're trying to do the best we can. We will adapt and change and, and all that. So that's it. One last thing that I would just like to say, I'm kind of with Linda on this. Not only from the standpoint of pointing people down to the, and again, I, I don't know Kim and Linda, I, I, I have nothing against them or in favor of them, but she'd be geography kind of people. People live in geography. She is a geography kind of person. I think, she works here. I think the people yeah, that yes. work for the county ought to be geography kind of people, and the people you appoint to other things. Linda, you're fired. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have nothing against them. I have a tax I pay money here, I do. But that's just my own. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your input. And, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. No, I appreciate that input. That, that helps. I mean, it, when, and as Blake and Ralph will both say, when we're considering alternates, we got this pool of people we got to choose from. And sometimes, eh, you know, we want to pick the best person, and sometimes we pick the most expedient person rather than giving it a tremendous amount of thought. You know how that works. Plenty of people around. That's right. Well, okay. I move. Thank you. I appreciate it. I move we adjourn. Have you not been here long enough? All right. Are we adjourn? Yes. Yeah.